And my, my name is Ben Raskin. I'm the head of horticulture and agroforestry at the Soil Association. Uh, and I'm also running a uh, agroforestry planting at Helen Browning's farm in Wiltshire. Um, some of the photos you'll see are from, from that. Um, it's also just worth mentioning that my colleague Kate Still is on the call as well. Uh, my background, hi, hi, yeah, there you go, Kate's waving. Uh, my background is horticulture, um, sort of vegetables and trees. I'm not uh, an animal expert, I'm not a grazing expert. So, um, where I know there was one question, for instance, about holistic grazing, which I can cover a little bit, but if we have, if we get into sort of technical livestock questions, I'm going to be relying on uh, Kate to cover my ignorance on that. So what I thought I would do um, is just go through, uh, let me just, uh, I'm going to hide everybody's face now, so I can't see you. So if you do have a question, you'll have to go to chat. Uh, oh, is that nice stopped? There we go. Uh, so broadly speaking, I thought we'd just start with a, a very quick overview of agroforestry. I'm sure most of you are aware of that, but uh, just to sort of set the, the parameters. Then we'll look specifically at some of the potential of forage for tree from trees and, and how that can supplement uh, grass forage. And then we'll go through maybe some options of how you can implement agroforestry on farm. Um, and as uh, Catherine said, I'll try and cover some of the questions that came up before the session as I go through, um, but there will be time afterwards to cover those as well. So, in terms of the general principles, uh, obviously agroforestry is agro crops, forestry trees. Um, <clears throat> the and we think of it generally as that deliberate integration of the of the two aspects. So, uh, whether it's animals, uh, as in silver pasture, or whether it's crops, as in silver arable. Um, the idea is that it's not just sort of having a few trees on the farm, although obviously that can be a good thing but it's it's where you deliberately uh, cultivate both those aspects um, and try and make them work together for the benefits of, of both sides and it's probably worth saying that even the experts and people who have been working on this for decades can't really agree on an exact definition uh, of what constitutes agroforestry uh, you know some people say hedges are some people say they aren't some people say individual trees in a field aren't and some people say they are I'm not going to get too hung up on that. Um, I think it's broadly looking at any trees that you have in your farm and working out how to uh, make the best use of them, uh, but equally looking at how you might plant new ones. Uh, and I guess it's also worth saying that this isn't really a very new concept, although talking about it in this way is is relatively new in this country. Um, historically, you know, hedgerows would have been much more productive and useful than they have become. Uh, and similarly, in other parts of the world, agroforestry is a very well used system. Uh, so we've got a lot to draw on, um, both in this country and abroad, but it's finding ways to to learn, I guess, more about exactly how those interactions work and how we can make use of them. <coughs> so broadly speaking, um, the, the concept is, you know, what you see above ground is what is below ground with plants. So if we're just growing short grass or if we're just growing a crop of wheat, then we're really only using quite a shallow amount of the soil. Uh, and we're also only using all of that sunlight and water for certain times of the year. Uh, so by integrating trees, we can, uh, we can make better spatial use of the soil and the light, but we can also make better temporal use as we go through the season. Often trees will come into leaf earlier and go out of leaf later than than annual crops will. Um, and then, you know, obviously trees will have much deeper roots that can use some of that subsoil that we might not be using and actually might just be damaging with some of our annual cultivations. Uh, and the I, the idea is by doing that, we can be we not only can improve our soil and improve our resilience, but we can potentially become more resilient. Uh, so, you know truly getting more from less as opposed to uh, just piling on uh, and sort of chasing big yields. Uh, and some of the <clears throat> some of the specific benefits that we can bring to our system through bringing these trees in, we can improve our soil health and nutrition. Uh, the that cycle of, of nutrients with with 
the roots bringing them up, the leaves falling onto the soil, we can increase our soil organic matter. By having areas of our farm that are not cultivated, we can build the fungal population. So that is another way of, of sequestering carbon, um, but also we can start to shift that fungal bacterial ratio in our soil a little bit more towards the fungi, which for a lot of crops, trees especially, but for, for a lot of other crops is useful too. Uh, we can improve infiltration uh, by breaking up some of those lower pans in the soil, uh, and that can help uh, soils, to particularly heavy soils, to to dry out more quickly, um, potentially making them more more useful for longer in the year. Uh, uh, I, well, I went for too long, you know. I could I could spend the whole presentation talking about how uh, trees help soil health, but um, I will try to keep moving to make sure we have room for some of the specifics. Uh, there's obviously there's an animal health and welfare benefit. We'll come on a, a bit more into this in the later section. But uh, you know, if it's really hot or it's really cold, uh, I know where I want to be and it's under a tree. Um, and most animals feel the same. Most of our uh, farmed livestock are traditionally woodland or woodland edge creatures. They like being around trees. They like having cover from predators. And uh, there was even a study I think recently that showed that the the human animal livestock interactions the positive interactions between cows and the, the people that look after them were improved were, were more positive when there were trees in the system so actually just having trees there makes makes animals happier um, and we'll obviously get onto the the diet as well in more detail uh, these uh, I sort of group these together again some of these are more relevant if you're in a crop situation rather than a livestock situation. Uh, the top left one, that is not a fuzzy out of focus picture, that's uh, soil blowing away. Um, uh, so, you know, trees will break that, will slow that wind down, they, they'll catch some of that soil, they'll reduce the, the potential from erosion. Uh, again, that water picture is after maize, uh, not so much of a problem obviously on grassland, but you can help infiltration and protect the soil with, with carefully planted trees. Uh, and the crop health one is, is really around that improvement of pollinators and predators. It's around spacing of trees, increased spacing to, to give the, uh, reduce the fungal populations. Uh, and it's about, uh, for the annual crops in between, you can increase temperatures and create microclimates that again, uh, increase the opportunity or the, the season length for growing particular crops. So moving on to um, the potential of forage, um, and Kate, you can jump in at any point if you uh, think there's a something I've missed on this bit. So silver pasture, so trees with livestock, I've mentioned a couple of those benefits, shade and shelter, uh, increased productivity. So if, a, if an animal is not having to spend all of its energy keeping warm, uh, it, can keep, it can spend some of that energy putting on weight or producing more milk. Uh, the, there are some very clear studies that have been done with, uh, with a range of animals showing that increased productivity. Uh, the drainage on heavy land I've mentioned, and actually even at Eastbrook where we've planted what will be a grazed woodland, so at the moment it's still just little sticks in the ground just starting to sprout, but already in two seasons we had an area that flooded every year. It was a, a, a depression that flooded. And you know, this winter when we've we just it rained and rained and rained, it never flooded. And so even just with that short period, I think of of having those trees in, it's made a difference on the drainage. Uh, so we can reduce pest and disease, and particularly, for instance, if you've got sort of wet areas along a stream where you've got the risk of liver fluke, you can strategically plant trees to improve drainage or to to sort of shelter shelter the animals and sort of keep them away from those worst areas. Uh, there is obviously, with the, if you plant the wrong trees in the wrong place, there is potential to increase some pests. So you do need to be be aware. There isn't, you know, not every tree is perfect in every spot. So you still need to get that design right. Uh, the improved soil health we've talked about, uh, but potentially uh, the better diet. So most animals can replace or supplement some of their 
grass-based forage diet with trees, uh, and it varies according to species. Uh, so cattle, up to sort of 50, 55 percent of their of their diet can be from from browsing. Sheep a bit more, um, and goats can have almost all of it from from browsing. So so first of all, that's worth noting that you know obviously you will still need some grass. Uh, but you can have really quite a high proportion uh, of that. And some of that will depend obviously on what you're browsing and some of it will depend on breed within the species as well. Uh, and looking at, oh, sorry, yeah, go on. I was just gonna say, before we move on, um, Ian had a question about com soil compaction, um, reducing, uh, so the compaction from grazing um, on heavy land, reducing tree growth. So we're just going going back slightly, but um, but that yeah, so that that can it can certainly be an issue. What I think what they tend to find is that the more trees you have, uh, the less compaction you tend to get. So I, I mean, if I've understood the question, I guess there's a question of um, is it just overall compaction from the grazing? Um, often where you have not very many trees you can get some really bad compaction around those trees because there's too much stock trying to shelter under it or to graze it um, so that can be an issue on when you have a small number of trees uh, it, it, what about uh, when it, they're getting established um, so does it reduce the tree growth when they're, they're younger yeah it, it, it can do potentially um, I think again if you've got the more trees you have the less you're likely to get them all going around one tree or, or one mm -hmm. group of trees um, but certainly if you're worried about that then keeping them a bit further away from the trees in the establishment phase can help um, and we will get on to potential fencing options later okay. as well um, okay. and, and, it, and I think to potentially it links into systems design um, and to whether you want to also sort of start to look at more rotational holistic grazing systems when you put the trees in. Um, okay. And there's, so in, in the picture I've got up, for example, we've got rows of trees, but each one's individually fenced and you can see that animals are quite close to that and might <laughs> well be causing some compaction. Uh, at Eastbrook, we, with our alley cropping, <clears throat> we've got a three meter strip with electric fencing on each side, which obviously keeps them away from the immediate tree root area. Um, but I think with all of these things, there's so many factors to consider that it's, it's quite hard to sort of recommend a solution for a particular farm. And I think a lot of it will depend on how you're going to manage it going forward and what you want the trees to do. Thank you, Ben. Does that answer your question, Ian? Let us know if there's anything you want to follow up on in the chat box. Thanks, Ben. Okay, great. Um, so one of the other sort of things that, that I was struck by when I started looking at some of these things was the the level, the protein levels comparing uh, silage and grass forage with some of the trees, um, and particularly looking at things like mulberry, which has a very high um, protein level. So, but, but basically all of them compare well with silage, and you know, not too bad compared to grass forage. Um, and again, I don't know enough about the requirements of particular livestock to know sort of which is better and what you'd expect in any particular system. Um, but generally looking at the, the protein levels, if that's, if that's what your concern is, then, then a lot of them will compare perfectly well um, with some of the traditional feed. The other benefit we can get from, uh, from the, the trees is that they, Generally, most of them will have higher tannin levels than grass or, or mixed lays, uh, which will benefit your, uh, re reduce your internal parasite burden. Uh, so that's a, a sort of added health benefit. Um, and there's, there's a lot of evidence of the sort of different tannin levels of different tree species. And then this, this is where it gets quite interesting as well. So this is from one of the Ag Forward, which I'll come on to, I'll signpost you to later, but one of their research documents. And it was looking at the different macro and micronutrients in, uh, in trees versus grass. Uh, they've looked at willow and alder, and obviously alder is not a sort of a particularly good browsing species anyway. Uh, and you can see that in most of these cases, willow is better 
for these micronutrients. But in, in almost all of the the cases, apart from the K, the, the willow is massively higher um, in in most of those micronutrients than, than the grasses. Um, and certainly if you look at poplar and, and mulberry, I think it'll be fairly similar. So you've got a real opportunity to uh, to increase your, the micro and macronutrients in the diet from bringing some tree species in. And then one of the other sort of big questions when you start looking at how you're going to plant your system or what you know what level uh, of tree cover you might look at and one of the sort of big fears of a lot of farmers is well why, why am I going to lose all that grass um, by planting the trees um, so there, there are more studies this is this is sort of just one that I've pulled out um, you need to have a lot of shade before it really starts to reduce the growth of the understory um, so this particular study uh, looked at moderate, which is 45% sunlight, and dense uh, shade, which is 20% sunlight, on a whole range of forage um, species. Um, and all of them uh, did, you know, were, were higher under moderate shade. Uh, and, and for a lot of them, even under that very dense shade, so that's 20% uh, sunlight, 31 of them still did, still did well. Uh, and there's there's uh, there's various reasons for this, and it will depend a little bit on the season. So you know, for instance, in very in the in the summer of 2018 when it was really hot, some of the only green areas actually were under the trees where it was cooler. Um, but equally, there's evidence that the understory plants make better use of light when it's restricted. So it's not a straight equation that the light goes down and the and the production goes down. What they're able to do is they're able to to sort of say okay i'm not getting quite so much light but i can make better use of it and still produce the same yield and that's one of the reasons for this in increased productivity in agroforestry systems um, is you're you're forcing some of those plants to do better under the same conditions uh, but there, you know it's worth also saying that that the there is still that risk of root competition um but you know and you you will see that sometimes where you know the trees do compete with the grass at the edges so it's not it's not always a straightforward uh, equation of working out what does well at what times of year and it might be different in one year to another and it might be different from one species to another um, but generally you can have a lot of trees in your system and still have a productive understory um, so <clears throat> that's a, a sort of very quick canter through the potential for forage uh, and then I thought finally I would just go through again this isn't exhaustive uh, but just picking out a few of the ways um, for making use or, or introducing agroforestry on farm so, so I mean the quickest way to start this is to make better use of what you've got um, and I'm not suggesting that many of you have the tree the hedge on the left um, but you know you can immediately see the potential uh, for growing your hedges taller and wider. Uh, they will be better shelter belts. They'll provide more protection. Uh, they'll sequester more carbon. You know all of that, all of those benefits. Uh, and potentially it would require a change of management. So you know it might well be that you move, for instance, to a 10-year coppicing rotation on your hedges rather than a biannual uh, flailing uh, for instance uh, but but if you start to sort of think in a way about what you've got on the farm already um, and looking at uh, you know looking at okay I've got this area of hedge or I, you know maybe I've got a small area of trees that I'm not really doing anything with is there an option for bringing stock into those at certain times of year you know maybe for occasional browsing or maybe in a really hot summer for shelter, or it might be bringing them in for lambing where they can you know, make better use of the, of the shelter for that. So really sort of having an assessment of what trees and hedges you've already got on your farm is a really good place to start. Uh, and I'm sure some of you are already uh, sort of well down that route. Uh, 
bulking out shelter belts really is another easier where you've got a hedge for instance is is there an opportunity to widen that hedge so uh, there's an established picture on the left there um, the one on the right is one of our fields at Eastbrook um, and you can just about see the sort of taller trees on the left hand side which follow a little brook that runs through that field <clears throat> but a lot of the wind is coming that way we wanted to to break that up a bit we wanted to create another a uh, thicker line of trees along the side of that field. So we've planted, as you can see, uh, four rows there, uh, or five rows, can't remember now, uh, of, of trees along that side of the field and, and the top end. Um, so that's going to bring a lot of those benefits. And at some point, we may use that shelter belt for bringing stock into, but initially the idea will be uh, that it's just grown up um, as a windbreak. And and again, looking at your existing hedges and thinking, is that hedge really doing as much as it could be? And I was up at a farm in West Wales with a horticultural grower who had a, you know, what he thought was was a nice uh, hedge protecting his tunnels, but he's still losing some of his tunnels over winter and the plastic blowing away. And actually, when we looked at that hedge, it had some good bits in it, but also there were some real gaps. Um, and there were some areas where it was quite thin. Uh, so for him, you know, he said, oh, actually, yeah, it really makes sense. I can, I'm gonna effectively plant another hedge on the other side of it to, to bulk that up and that should give me that benefit. So grazed woodlands, I mean, you know, there's again, there's sort of wood pasture is, a, is another term and there's different densities sometimes that come into this. So, you know, you can have effectively the one on the right, which is, a woodland um, that that you bring stock into for short periods uh, and it is really careful it's important to manage that really carefully you know it's not just about letting the stock go through the trees all year um, it's about sort of making sure you sort of put them in at the right time take them out at the right time and that will depend on your local conditions um, there's the picture on the bottom left is obviously a more open uh landscape with with groups of trees and individual trees um and then sort of bigger areas of grass uh and the one at the top is our new planting at eastbrook which we're hoping at some point will look more like the one underneath it um so we've planted uh, effectively rows uh, of trees they're quite close spacing at the moment and there's a couple of wider rides that go through there um and we'll thin them out and, and let the stock in and sort of eight, 10 years time when they're big enough. Um, but that will be a, an area that we hope will look a bit like the one at the bottom. The, so these are browsing blocks. I mean, this actually isn't a picture of browsing blocks, but I couldn't find anywhere a picture of browsing blocks because they seem to be a sort of relatively new concept. These are tightly planted mulberry trees, which is one thing that you can use for browsing blocks. And the idea with these is you you have an area of quite uh, densely planted trees um, and the ones we're trying at Eastbrook are willow, poplar and when I can get hold of the plants, mulberry. Uh, and effectively you treat them like an area of, uh, of grass or, or a paddock and you let the stock in at a certain time of year to graze them, effectively coppice them. Uh, so they go in heavy and quick and then you pull them out again before they kill the plant, hopefully, uh, and then let it regrow for, you know, a year or two years, uh, depending on how vigorous it is before taking it in. So it's an area, uh, again, in, in 2018, when the grass had stopped growing, you know, an area like this would have still been very productive and had and had a lot for the livestock to feed on. Um, or you can use it as a, you know, a supplementing feed system within it so there's lots of opportunities to to think how you might have areas of those blocks uh, around the farm and the way we've looked at it with this the field that we're, we're looking at it's a it's a big long field um the it's nearly a kilometer long and we've got sort of it's not a, a nice straight shape so we've got these various little kind of funny corners so we're gradually planting those up to to browsing blocks um because they're kind of awkward anyway um, and, and it should make the management of that field a bit easier, but also uh, give us more opportunities in terms of feeding the stock. But Ben, the idea with those blocks is they obviously have grass as well, do they? Or are they just given the 
Well, my, uh, I mean, I'm very new new to them. So, so we've only just plant, literally planted them up this this winter. Um, the the density we've planted them once they get going there won't be a lot of grass in between grass yeah like just looking at your picture there yeah yeah so yeah and i mean these i my guess is that even these would get a bit bigger so i mean yes of course there will be grass underneath um you, you know, could almost not... supplement with silage or something couldn't you if you were doing it in terms of if you needed to supplement the ration because of the if the trees couldn't necessarily provide everything the stock needed depending on the time of year um yeah just thinking about how you could how you could manage that density of of tree yeah. you know without them then just going and you know hammering all the grass if you had them in quite a small area that was all yeah yeah and yes i'm sure, yeah you're absolutely right you can supplement but and certainly the key is definitely not to leave them too long in with the trees or they would you know they would destroy yeah, really them. do a lot of damage yeah yeah uh, and and I you know I can't pretend that I know how we're going to manage that exactly, um, or how <laughs> difficult it's going to be to get them out again. <laughs> no, I, no. I don't think it's well wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a there's a American um, guy, uh, Steve Gabriel, um, who who came over actually a year or so ago and did a, a session with us. But he so his book is called Silver Pasture, and he's a big fan of these browsing blocks. Um, and he does online courses and stuff as well. So he, you know, if you want specifically to find out more about these, he would definitely be a good person to find them out from. And I'd certainly recommend his book anyway. We've um, got a similar question, actually. It's just come in from Tracy, um, talking about grazing dense woodland. Um, you mentioned it's important to manage when they're in there. Um, can you expand on the factors you need to take into account? Yes, yeah, so I think, I mean, first of all, it's worth saying that not every woodland should be grazed um you know there are definitely some ancient woodlands and you know woods with particular uh flora that you know you shouldn't you shouldn't be grazing so it's, it's worth making sure that it's not one of those um and then and then i guess it's really it's looking at what time of year you you put them in uh you know so and putting them in for short periods you know they will compact the ground and potentially damage the understory if they're left in too long uh, i mean pigs obviously more than others but but even you know cattle to some extent um and and it's looking at what you want them to do you know are you so for instance within that dense woodland you could be looking at coppicing some of the species or pollarding some of the species to create uh, more varied height uh, you know, if it's an if it's a woodland that was so one one area we looked at was with someone uh, last year was some woodland that had been planted up 20 years ago and not really managed since then. So it was very densely planted. Everything was the same age. Everything, you know, that had survived was a similar height. And and so we were looking at how we could bring the cows in to you know probably they'd end up you know knocking over some of the wheat trees and clearing some of that anyway. Um, we were looking at, at cutting out a proportion of them to create some glades um, and then potentially also, uh, you know, for things like the, the hazel, for instance, we could, you know, we could coppice that and, and they could come in and browse them occasionally. So, so I think it depends a little bit on, on what's there and what you want them to do. Uh, I think Tracy's saying that it's exactly that same, same sort of um, situation. Tracy, did you want to expand any and on that at all do you want to unmute and hi it's Tracy here yes we've got nearly 25 acres of land which was planted under a forestry commission grant 30 years ago we by someone else and we bought the land not knowing what to do with it and we haven't done anything at all until this year when we decided we'd put in a dozen young red stock cattle to just try and break it down a bit because it was getting so dense there was hardly any light in there at all and what light there was was producing nettles and we decided that either we end up with a lot of machinery going in there or we could try pushing the cattle in so that's what we've done but I just wanted to make sure we're not going to do any ir irretrievable damage. It'd be really interesting to hear how, what they have done in there and certainly with a yeah with a newish planting i don't think they'll have done much damage from that point of view but it'd be interesting yeah how how what's happened since you've introduced them well just for a novice who doesn't understand trees very well i think it's really exciting 
because when we first went in there, we lost them constantly. We couldn't find them because it was so dark, but they have really opened it up so you can see through the, you know, they've destroyed the understory, if you like. They've broken quite a lot of low hanging branches, ripped off the leaves from most of those. And it's really opened it up to so that there's a bit more light coming through. And the grass is starting to grow better in those areas. For some reason, there are areas that, that are very, very dense they're not going into, and they still are just filled with nettles. And I don't know if it's just because they're so dark, even they're scared of what's in the forest. <laughs> I don't know. But it's been interesting, and they're creating these open They often go around the edges where there's a bit more light. So we found that we could find them in there. But occasionally now when we go in looking for them, it's like listening for a herd of elephants. So they, <laughs> they've got their confidence. When they first came, went in, they were quite quiet. But now when you go and look for them, they're quite happily ripping a, a branch off or you know pushing against something. And it does sound like they're, they're much bigger animals than they are in that space, which is interesting to see how they seem to have become confident in the space over the let's see about it's about seven eight weeks that they've been in there now that's really fascinating i'd love to follow up actually with you and you know maybe uh document that because i think that's a really interesting uh experiment in a way yeah well feel free um let me know after the the call yeah. and we can up. okay thank you sorry to interrupt carry on no no good and i, I think it, it I mean, it highlights in a way one of those questions when you start asking questions about what to do in a particular circumstance, you know, you do have to think about what you want from that. You know, are you looking for are we are we working towards, a, you know, a forest in that case? Or are you looking at, um, you know, maximizing the output from harvestable timber? Are you looking for a system that is, you know, are you prioritizing your animal health and production and, and whichever of those choices or more that you might make will have an effect on how you decide to to manage those trees um so you know one of the options for instance in that situation that we were talking about was do we take out strips of you know 20 meters of trees so we choose some of the you know where the trees haven't done so well and we literally clear fell strips in between um and have long alleys of grass um potentially even at some point you know do some crops there uh, but that requires, you know, different management technique to actually just letting the the animals in and doing it themselves. Um, but yeah, it's it's to say there's so many variables on these things in terms of you know what animals you've got, what trees there are, what the climate is, what your soil's like, you know, all of that, all of that stuff that it uh, it makes it very interesting, um, but also sometimes hard to make decisions. Yeah, and, and the land is actually owned by our neighbour, so we're sort of collaborating. So she's okay. trying to work out what she wants, but she needed our cattle. And just before we move on, the thing that other people may be interested in is I've really noticed this thing about the health of the animals. I decided I normally use, I've had to use anaphyletic, you know, wormers over the years. And I decided this year, because I knew that I was putting them into those trees, not to worm them at all. So they haven't been wormed for over nine months now. And I put them in and there's no sign of any parasite load on them at all. They seem to be very, very happy and they're putting on weight. You know, obviously we're not weighing them, just looking at them. They're doing extremely well. That's, what yeah. what species of trees is it that you've got in the the in the it's a sort of traditional woodland English mix. So we've got oak, we've got ash, we've got wild cherry there's older there's a few more scrubby bits and pieces sure yeah i'm not sure of the full list but they're, they're you know the main thing yeah your classic ones yeah yeah the, the classic sort of woodland mix that was available 30 years ago under a forest yeah, commission sure. <laughs> yeah. right. they love so, so. they're all all high as a kite on the wild cherries so they they really <laughs> That Brilliant. was a great little diversion. I enjoyed that. Right. We've actually got a sorry. Before we move on, okay. a similar similar question, but about sheep. Um, and is there a problem with them stripping the bark um, and killing the trees? Uh, and does it depend on the breed? Um, Joe has Hebrideans, and they love the bark. Yeah. Again, 
a lot of it will depend on the age of the tree. Um, I believe some trees are more palatable than others, and certainly my understanding is some breeds do it more than others. Um, but uh, you know, you certainly don't want to be taking them into young trees. Um, but what if you've got? I think that it also partly depends on how hungry they are. So if they've got enough other stuff to eat, um, I think they mostly don't attack the bark from older trees. Um, but that's not to say they won't. Um, but basically, the older the tree, the safer it is. Okay. Um, so worth a, a an experiment to to trial it. Is that? The... I mean, there are there are particular breeds. So um. Uh... Liz, our colleague, has Shropshire sheep, and they are known, or well, supposedly not to eat the well, are not to eat the trees at all, are they? So I guess, mm. um, and that's why you have them in orchards to actually prevent them because they're known not to eat trees at all. But I guess it's that delicate balance of wanting them to graze the the leaves a bit, but not actually strip the bark, which must be more challenging. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Joe? Is there anything else you wanted to to ask or? Expand on. Can I mute up? Oh. Uh, yeah, just pop it in the, the chat box. Um, uh, Martin was asking Kate if you've taken any worm samples. I don't know whether that was. I think it's probably targeted at Tracy, probably. Tr Tracy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe she could respond in the chat. Pop, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, that'd be great. Um, oh, and one more from Ian. Um, is there a possible possible seasonal effect? Trees more susceptible in spring with the sap rising, susceptible to um, the sheep stripping the bark, presumably. Good point. Quite possibly. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Bro, okay. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Keep your questions coming. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so this is uh, our alley system at Eastbrook. Uh, the the spacing is based on uh, Stephen Briggs's maths, which is uh, based actually around cropping, where we've got uh, between the between each alley of trees, we've got a twenty four meter grass paddock, uh, and then a three meter strip for the trees. And the idea of the twenty four meters is that because 24 is divisible by 12, 8, 6, 4, 3, and 2, you can fit any piece of machinery through there. Um, so although at the moment ours is a graze system uh, and it's on quite heavy land, uh, we would like to keep our options open for cropping it. It has been cropped occasionally in the past. Uh, so we've left sort of big wide headlands and, and these uh, alleys of that width so that we can crop it if we decide to. Uh, what we've got in species-wise, the row that you can see is a mixture of peri pears interplanted with willow and alder. Uh, there's also some of the rows have timber species in, so we've got some hornbeam, cherry, uh, wild service, and oak. <coughs> um, and sort of moving, so the the idea with this really is that you have you break up your field with these uniformed rows of trees it makes the management of them uh, easier potentially and particular with crops like the pears where we'll need to come in and harvest on an annual basis having them in a, a straight row uh, makes life a little bit easier uh, the other thing that it has meant is that we can now rotationally graze this field so it, it previously was just one big 45 acre field um, and it's now been split into uh, effectively 17 paddocks of slightly different sizes but broadly speaking they're a couple of hectares each uh, and again one of the interesting discussions on a on a bigger farm where there's lots of people involved in different areas not all of them who were necessarily up for this idea of planting trees all over the place um, and the, the the stockman initially was you know a little bit dubious about these rows of trees going across the field but actually he was really keen on trialing out uh, rotational grazing so it's given him effectively now this very easy paddock system um, and we have endless debates about the best ways to fence and protect against trees. 
um, and we opted here for this permanent electric fencing. Uh, it's mains electric, uh, so with the electrified bungees across. So although it's more expensive, obviously, than temporary netting, it's, it worked out at one pound uh, twenty a meter, uh, and it's single strand, uh, which keeps everything but the hairs and the muntjac away. So then we do have to put a spiral guard around each tree. Uh, but it's obviously a lot cheaper than than sort of deer fencing the entire field uh, or or even than sort of traditional stock fencing uh, and so far it's worked so we, we've got the the young dairy stock in there it's it's an area of the farm that's sort of a bit away from the milking parlor so we don't have the the milking cows in there um, and apart from right at the beginning when the fencing wasn't up properly we haven't had any damage uh, they've kept well enough away probably we would go slightly narrower um, if we would in our next bit so I think we might well go for two and a half meters uh, rather than three meter strip um, just to reduce that area of rough grass on each side of the tree uh, but again it's it's a difficult balance because although it is a bit messy um, and there's quite a lot of thistles this year uh, equally the wildlife is just astounding and it's amazing how quickly that wildlife has come in uh, you know, within six months of planting up an alley of trees, we saw uh, a huge increase in kites, buzzards, kestrels, barn owls, uh, you know, more butterflies. We've got orchids now in some of the alleys. Um, and, and you know, so having that and, and even sort of things like meadow pipit, which apparently love this kind of mixed scrub strip. Uh, so, you know, while you could argue that it's unproductive and that it's a bit of a pain to manage, it does also bring a benefit, but it's weighing up how much of it you sacrifice uh, for, you know, for, for reduced productivity. And longer term, obviously, the trees will spread um, and, you know, you won't get that same area of, of rough ground. Um, and at some point uh, in the future, we'll remove the fencing um, and probably the willow and the alder that's in between will just disappear as the trees get bigger. Um, so that's one way of fencing. Obviously, you can individually fence each tree or areas of tree. Um, so the area on at Eastbrook where we've got some of the higher value trees, we've got a lot of fruit and nut trees in one of the fields. We we have deer fenced that entire field. That's only eight acres, so it's a smaller field. Um, but you know, it was uh, something like fourteen thousand pounds to fence that field. Um, but the value of the trees made it worthwhile. Um, the there are I think it was um, there was a question about fencing uh, and about about individual trees. The <clears throat> there's a thing called a cactus guard, um, which is relatively new. I think it's only been available in this country for a couple of years. Um, which is like it's an individual tree guard, but it's got lots of it's like sort of big barbed wire. It's got big spikes pointing outwards, uh, and it comes as a kit, and you sort of clip it around the tree. Um, and Dartington have been doing some experiments with that and found it pretty effective. Um, they're not, I can't remember now the individual costs. They're not sort of, they're not ridiculously cheap, but they're a lot cheaper than sort of big parkland fences or, you know, and probably if you factor in the time, they're, they're cheaper than creating a wooden and, you know, wooden fence around each tree. So that's one option to look at. Um, if you've got groups of trees, then obviously you can put area, you know, you can put some, fencing around that group um, it's it does depend a little bit about uh, you know about what you're protecting it against um, so in the first year in this field for instance we did have six foot wire mesh guards a little bit like the white ones you can see there but but made of this sort of green plastic mesh uh, and it, it worked pretty well we didn't get any deer damage we didn't put strong enough stakes in uh, so we have ended up having to go back and replace the stakes. And if there's one thing I would just always recommend, it's just put in a much bigger stake than you think is necessary. Because um, it's definitely cheaper doing that at the beginning than going back and fixing it three times. Um, but but the, the, the tree guard itself worked pretty well. Um, the, you know, and then it, it comes down to, to height as well. So, you know, if you've got a deer problem, then you need it that much. We don't, although technically the deer could jump the fence we've got that you can see in the picture, because I think because there's two fences, 
uh, they tend not to like to jump over one where they can't see a good exit out the other side. Um, and I'm guessing as well, you know, the fact that it's uh, electrified helps. Um, but we are, we're planning to do a, some more work on the fencing stuff and potentially even a, a separate webinar on fencing trees. Um, the other thing that I'm really interested in that I'd, we're hoping to do a trial on Eastbrook is uh, is trying to do it without any plastic at all and looking at uh, mixing the tree seed in with wood chip uh, and then effectively laying the wood chip in a strip and potentially even mixing um, bramble seed and gorse seed in with it so that it all grows up together and the gorse and the bramble protect the trees until they come out and then you thin out the trees to the final spacing. Um, in theory, that should be possible. Um, but uh, but yes, again, I don't know sort of many people that have particularly tried it. Um, so that's sort of a bit of a canter through the fencing, but I don't know if anyone has any other questions on fencing while we're on the topic. There's a, qu a couple of questions on um, alleys. Um, Joe's asking, did you plant the permanent, plant straight into the permanent pasture or is there a different grass mix along the alleys? We planted it straight in. We What we did is we took a subsoiler and um, created a slit that we then planted into, which made planting uh, like 10 times as quick. But uh, because it's heavy clay soil, in 2018, we had a real problem with the split opening up again. Mm. Um, and uh, what, in hindsight, what I think we should have done is just planted a couple of inches along from the slit but also we've been using a lot of wood chip for mulching um, and in that in 2018 we didn't get on quickly enough to mulch the trees um, and the ones that went in in January were mostly okay but the ones that we didn't get until February March really suffered so we did lose quite a lot but um, but I think wood chip mulch really really helps with tree establishment um, but yeah so in answer to your question it was straight into the pasture we didn't do another mix I think I think the, there is an option for that, but it does, you know, it creates more work and cost. Um, so, so all of these things I think have to be balanced out. Um, I don't think there's there's necessarily an easy answer. Um, Brilliant. Let us know if you want to ask any more uh, on that, Joe. I know your uh, microphone's not working. Um, and sort of uh, can, related to when you're talking about biodiversity um, martin was asking about do you whether you know uh how it's proposed to treat agroforestry under the new elms um payment system because uh, with eps uh, yeah. people keep uh, they rpa keep remapping various clients from permanent pasture to non-eligible woodlands but it's clearly yeah. historically wood pasture yeah which is a big problem um yeah what we, we don't know is a short answer but what we have done so organic research center abacus woodland trust and ourselves have put in for a test and trials to depra around um, how elms can support agroforestry we're due to hear today or tomorrow whether that's been accepted um we're quite optimistic because the all the noises we've had are that uh, DEFRA do want to support agroforestry and they see the benefits of it, but they don't quite understand how to do it. Um, so we're confident that we'll get the funding to do more of that um, research. It's a two and a half year project. We'll be liaising with farmers um, and advisors uh, on what would you know, encourage them to, to do more agroforestry. So we don't know it's a short answer, but we are hopefully uh, going to be very closely engaged with DEFRA in working that out uh, and uh, if you can i yeah, it's martin i've got my um, microphone working at long last uh, sorry <laughs> um just a related question if you don't mind it do you think so sort of nuts and fruits uh in the agroforestry context will be treated separately or do you think it'll all sort of be lumped together I don't know. It's a really good question, and and some of this revolves around what is deemed to be a public good and what is deemed to be a private good. So, you know, if if farmers are going to be paid for the public goods, then in some ways it shouldn't matter what that tree is. You know, whether you're using it to give value to your livestock or whether you're going to be selling a crop, it shouldn't make any difference because you should be being paid for 
you know the carbon sequestration or the water infiltration or uh, you know the biodiversity or whatever the public good that it's supposedly delivering um, but at this stage we just have no idea I guess um, but we would certainly you know we'd like to try and see a separation between uh, you know what the farmer is going to do with the tree and what are the public goods that it's delivering because um, that seems to be the you know the fairest way of doing it really otherwise you can get into some really you get some really silly you know, you could you could see a situation where people might chop down a mature walnut tree and plant a you know something else just for the sake of getting a you know a payment. So there's some there's a real risk of unintended consequences in some of this stuff. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Uh, just to add as well, Martin and everybody, um, we've got a programme running at the moment called Taking Stock, which is um, looking at how the new elms. Um, system might apply to livestock farmers so if you're not already signed up to that i'll send a link in an email afterwards um, and we should be keeping you up to date with things as they develop i think this was my final slide by the way uh yeah so so we can we can have lots more questions um if there are more um not at the moment but please um everyone add, add them and uh and come to them in a moment the uh i mean the wood chip one I, I, i'm a bit obsessed by wood chip at the moment but um so one of the things with the i mentioned that i was into planting with willow and alder uh so the willow is potentially for for browsing um but also the, the idea is that we'll copy some wood chip quite a lot of those interplanted um trees uh, there's a really interesting project that the Organic Research Centre are just finishing off, uh, looking at adding ramial wood chip. So that's the wood chip that's smaller than seven centimetres diameter, uh, and chipping that and adding it fresh to the soil, uh, you know, scattering it, so not not sort of masses. Um, and there's there is some evidence that because it's higher, it's got a higher nitrogen content because it's that young wood um, with more bark and, and potentially some leaf, that it doesn't have any uh, nitrogen lockup effect when you add it directly to the soil um, and potentially has a, a really sig significant impact on soil health and, and soil life. Um, so, so that's one of the things we're going to be looking at. So some of that wood chip will probably be used to remulch the, the larger trees um, and some of it we might well just sort of chip and spread straight into the alleys in between. Um, and, and the the willow particularly, I mean, we had an innovative farmers field lab looking at willow chip on apple trees, um, and there was uh, some work had been done by uh, Glyn Percival, who's a, a sort of tree specialist, looking at uh, individual species uh, wood chip mulches. Um, and one of their experiments had shown that the apple trees that had had a willow mulch on uh, were significantly less scabby. Um, and it seems that the salicylic acid in willow uh, triggers an immune response in the tree to make it uh, better at fighting these diseases um, so we, we're going to potentially once we sort of get enough willow from the system we're going to be looking at some of that and seeing whether it makes a difference to the tree health as well any other questions Kat? sorry it's on mute um what depth would should the wood chip be on the topic of wood chip <clears throat> well so that's a really good question um i mean normally you would say probably three four inches um so you want it thick enough that it cuts the weeds out uh, what it doesn't do is uh, control perennial weeds particularly thistle and dock uh very well so you will still get that coming through after two or three years um, but you want it thick enough that it keeps the moisture in um, and keeps most of the annual weeds down. We did have an accidental experiment, um, which I haven't put a picture actually in this presentation, where we we were pollarding actually some old willows along the riverbank, and we dumped a, a trailer load of the wood chip over the fence into that new grazed woodland area I showed you. With the intention of spreading it out and mulching all the trees and then we never quite got around to it so there's some trees next to each other one of which has had uh probably about two feet of mulch and one of which has had nothing uh the tree that's had nothing is still about two and a half feet tall 
the tree that's had two foot of mulch is now nearly eight foot tall within the wow. same, same space of time. Um, unbelievable difference. So, and that was, again, that was during 2018. So a lot of that I suspect right. is, is moisture, moisture um, yeah. and weed control, but it, yeah. So the, with a lot of trees, you would be, you would need to be careful not to have it uh, up against the trunk. So you can, you can get fungal infections where it stays damp around the trunk. So the idea is that you sort of have it in a little dip. Um, but for stuff like, you know, for willow and older, that's not going to make any difference. But for, for some of the sort of more slightly less trees, it might. That, um, that comes on to Michael's question. He was asking um, if the wood chip does rot the bark, presumably that fungal it infection. Can, yeah, it, it can do, certainly. Um, and yeah, exactly that. So so you, you do need to. If, one, <clears throat> one of the ways we've done it. So um, obviously, once you've got the fencing up, it's quite hard to get in and mulch the trees so uh one of the farm guys has actually modified the their keenan uh, silage spreader to to sort of do the wood chip and he's created this extra shoot so it dribbles it all the way down one side of the of the trees and then we just have to come along with a rake and just sort of scoop it around each side and if you're doing it like that you can make sure that it's not piled up too high um or if you need to you can just go along by hand and and just tuck it away but yeah you do have to be careful about that brilliant thank you um I, so this is a slightly different question but it comes back to one that was mentioned in the um in the registration uh how have you planned the grazing of cattle and sheep in the fields identified by the current photo and i think in the registration questions there was one about um how agroforestry may work with the concept of holistic grazing yeah and the, one for you as well okay yeah. so so i guess one thing to say is that this farm eastbrook used to have a lot of sheep and a lot of cows they've actually because the management team have taken on a, another farm nearby that is more suited to sheep they've actually moved all the sheep off the farm so at the moment it is only cattle uh on this bit of the farm and there's pigs elsewhere but um so so they haven't got uh that mixed species grazing that they would have had uh, it might well come back to that. Um, so at the moment it is just cattle, but they are, you know, they're moving them. So, it, and again, I'm I, because I'm not there all the time, I don't see exactly how frequently they move. Um, but if, you know, there's... I think they're running quite a bit of a mob system, are they? Where they, they're letting the quite a high, it's, it's quite a long rotation, and then they're putting the yeah. cattle in where it's quite high. Yeah, yeah, I think generally. Yeah, and then obviously a lot in a in a relatively small area. So they, yeah, they tend to open one of those paddocks that you can see, or sometimes two. I think it probably depends on how busy they are and how often they want to come down and move them. Um, <laughs> so they normally have one or two of those paddocks open at any one time. Um, and the, you can see this sort of bit that they're on at the moment, that's where the water troughs are. So they've got the water troughs down one end, um, which allows them not to sort of have to move the water troughs every time as well. Um, and, you know, certainly when I was up there last week, the area of grass they'd just come into was probably uh, sort of two and a half feet tall, I would say. Um, and, and they'd got about halfway across the field um so you know the bit at the other end was going to be you know that much that bigger by the time they got to the end of it so uh, i mean you would you probably need to talk to um this you know this stockman there to know exactly how they're doing it but they're moving them i would say they're probably moving them every three or four days at the moment yeah uh, that would sound about right yeah tim did you want to add anything because i know um you've you've got a bit of agroforestry on your farm and your i think are you practicing holistic grazing as well something is something we are um it's something we are considering we there is the, with the grassland farm we have uh, at the moment there is a lot of grazed woodland which um hasn't necessarily been managed but it's something we're certainly looking to do and, and then look to, to try and adopt that over other areas of the farm as well. Um, so that's why I was that's why I wanted to ask that question really, and it'd be it'd be quite interesting to get the details of the of the of the stockman burn and and and, and speak speak to them really. My, my other question would be: Are we 
it's uh, on email are they going to be accessible anywhere following today so Kat's going to send through the presentations and I've got some further links as well but certainly I'm happy for people to email me afterwards with further questions and I'd certainly yes. um yeah absolutely and it did as one other thing uh Kat I know we're uh seven o'clock but there was a question as well about how long it takes to establish um yeah system um and again it is a bit of a sort of how long is a piece of string because it depends a little bit on uh you know what you're aiming for so sometimes agroforestry is seen as a temporary phase as you go towards forestry um so that, for instance there's a, some french systems where they're effectively growing say oat for timber but you do it at its final spacing and then you uh, you grow arable in between and the bit of arable that you grow shrinks and shrinks every year until effectively you have you know just just the trees uh, or you know in in this situation we're looking for a permanent agroforestry system so we've spaced it in a way you know those peri pear trees will get big but they're not going to block out um, all of that alley uh, and and because at the moment certainly it's you know it's a grey system we expect that to to fill that space so it depends a little bit on uh, on what you want to do with the system and it, and how quickly the trees will grow so you might be looking at uh, apple trees in which case they'll be at full production in 10 15 years um, or you know you're looking at oak trees which are not going to be ready for 100 years. Um, so the length of time to some extent will depend on what tree species you choose and what you're planning to do with the system. Great. Um, Joe is asking, are there any legal requirements such as landscape assessments on areas you intend planting trees? The, uh, yes, again, I mean, this is not an area of my expertise. There are some areas, you know, obviously you've got a triple SI or if you've got particular um, you know, species rich meadows, for instance, it's not great to cover them in trees. So there are certain things that you would not want to put agroforestry in particularly. Um, but I, I think in terms of legal requirements, unless you've got a legally protected feature or land, I think you can, um, but I would definitely recommend doing an assessment and, and understanding the potential impact it will have. Um, uh, yeah, not it's not. I'm not a sort of an expert on the legal side of that. Okay, thank you. Um, sort of similar territory, but um, what about uh, woodland creation grants? Um, are they still relevant so on our systems? They potentially. So the we did for the grazed woodland bit at, that we had at the farm. We did get a woodland creation grant for that. Uh, for all the other areas, we didn't. Um, so at the moment, the funding for agroforestry is pretty negligent um, and and a bit tricky. The shelter belts we did manage to get in. So there's some things that you you can get some funding for. Um, as I say, we're hoping that will improve um, under Elms. Uh, the the other thing that's worth looking out for is um, the local pots of money. For instance, we applied for some offset money from Network Rail, who were doing um, some electrification uh, along the London to Bristol route. So they had some money for farms in Gloucestershire and Oxfordshire that wanted to plant trees. Um, we didn't get the funding, incidentally, because I think they didn't really understand agroforestry. But um, but it, you know there is potentially sort of those particularly sort of offset um, type. Uh, pots of money that might be available um, but but often there you know you need to sort of know what's going on in your local area um, and I think <clears throat> certainly as the Soil Association we're looking at ways that we can help um, bring in more uh, funding to, to farmers to help set up agroforestry systems. I know that there's a lot of people wanting to do it but clearly it's an expensive business and uh, and you know it's a it's a hurdle for sure. There was an uh, there was another question which I think this slide probably answers perfectly, and I'm sure you can add a, a little bit too about how to get advice, help, and support when planning setting up of agroforestry. Yeah, so I mean, I've just listed a few things here. Um, you know, obviously there's our handbook, which I'm sure many of you have already downloaded, but if you haven't, it's there. 
Um, there's the, I would definitely recommend joining the Farm Woodland Forum. Um, so originally this was a group of um, academics who were working in agroforestry and it was sort of set up as a way to share information. Um, more recently, it's um, it started to get more farmer members. So it's becoming a really uh, vibrant kind of group of researchers and farmers. They have a, a really good kind of JISC email thing, which the, the amount and length of the responses you get to a question is, is just great. Uh, and there's some really knowledgeable people as part of that. So that's definitely worth joining. Um, the Ag Forward was a European project uh, which has got some really good resources um, and uh, you know case studies and uh, various documents. So that's really worth looking at. Um, and then Organic Research Centre uh, and Woodland Trust are both doing quite a lot in agroforestry. The Agroecology is a website which has a whole load of um, sustainable farming stuff on, but it has some quite good stuff on agroforestry as well. Um, and then there are, I haven't listed them here, but there are an, a small but gradually growing number of um, good agroforestry consultants. Um, you know, the ones that, <coughs> that we've been working with are people like Stephen Briggs and Ian Knight, who contributed to the handbook, uh, Steve Newman, who also did. Um, there's Niels Caulfield, there's, there's a, you know, but there's, I, in the last, actually in the last sort of three or four weeks, I've suddenly sort of come across a few more. And one of the questions for the DEFRA Elms thing is going to be about, you know, should there be a, an agroforestry consultancy um, sort of guild or something, you know, that's, so that you know that who you're going to actually knows what they're doing. Because I think because it is, because it's, there's such uh, an appetite for it and relatively small number of people that really know what they're talking about, there's a real risk that you can get bad advice. Hmm. Um, but uh, but yes, at the moment there isn't that. There are just a, a relatively small number of people. Um, but one of the things I think we do need to start doing is starting to sort of pull together a bit of a, a list of people that can offer that. Brilliant, thank you. And, and um, as you mentioned earlier, it's okay for people to uh, email you with questions if anything comes up. Yes, absolutely. Great. Um, we've just got one more question, but if anyone else has anything else burning, um, pop it in the chat box um, while we're just maybe coming to this last one. But um, so are there any specifically good breeds of tree for soil building for soil fertility? So, I mean, I think there there is quite a lot of variation of of what builds what. So, the the sort of the obvious one in a way is looking at a leguminous plant. So that's why alder is popular because it fixes nitrogen. You know, it's not the best one for grazing, but it does grow quickly and fix nitrogen. Um, and that's why we've interplanted quite a lot of our trees with that. Um, and then, you know, hopefully when we wood chip it and spread it, we're spreading some of that nitrogen around. So that's that's definitely worth looking at. Um, the I know Bangor University were doing some research into looking at the amount of root mass that different species put on. Um, and found, you know, quite a lot of difference. Um, so ash, for instance, uh, you know, although we're not going to be planting much of it, uh, was one of the best in terms of sort of really producing a lot of root mass. And uh, they were looking also at infiltration in that study. Um, but I think it's one of those areas where we we still know we don't know enough. Um, you know, there's there's when we were writing the handbook, there were lots of areas where we said, oh, we should be saying something about that. And then when we went to find out that we, we you know we couldn't find enough good information to put in it and I suspect you know exactly what effect different trees have and it, you know again it's probably dependent on soil um, type as well so so I think we've still got a lot to learn. Brilliant okay we haven't had any more questions in so I think that sounds like that's everything. Um, Great. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody. I'll send around an email afterwards with this, this recording and all of the slides. Um, oh, oh, Jay's just saying thank you very much. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for to Ben and Kate and for everyone for joining us and all your questions. Okay.